I wonder how many cars they wrecked shooting all the Fast and Furious movies. I think we've wrecked more cars than any other franchise on the planet. Hi, I'm Dennis McCarthy, head of vehicles for the Fast and Furious franchise. I'm here today to answer your questions on Twitter. This is Car Support. So Bullseye Bub has a question. Bro, how many gears do the cars in Fast and Furious have? Dude's been shifting like 20 times. Shifting always makes the scene a little bit more exciting. And for the most part, it should match what you're seeing on the screen. Yes, there's been a few straight line drag races where the amount of gear changes might exceed the transmission's available gears, but hey, you know, makes for a good scene. Now, if you look closely at some of the cars we've built for the movie, I, I represent them as a six-speed. A good, good example of that would be the Dodge Daytona in Fast 6. And it was a six-speed car. We put a manual six-speed in the car, and you know, my thought was that was a modified car. It wasn't like a restored classic. We can do whatever we want. You know, it helps that somatically because you can see the guy shifting gears. Oh, well, he has a six-speed, no wonder, he can keep going. In Fast 8, when we were in Cuba, we built, I think, 10 of those 50, 52 Chevys. And the scene is, he's at the end of the race, they're max speed, the car spins around, and he's going backwards. So the first thing that every car guy goes is, man, that's impossible, man, reverse is like first gear, he can't go that fast. If you look at the interior of the car, you'll see there's two shifters in that car. Why? Because he took it out of a tractor, it's Cuba, you gotta, make do with what you have. You need a transmission, you're not gonna go down to the store and buy one. You're gonna have to make something, you're gonna have to find something. In this case, he took the trans out of a tractor, so it had four forward gears and it had four reverse gears. And when you watch him slide, he comes around and he's moving two sticks. One of those things you're probably gonna have to watch in slow motion because I honestly can't even remember if it all got featured the way I dreamed it up, but I feel it's my responsibility to make it look realistic and make it explainable. Obviously, that's a challenge, but uh, you know, I always do my best at Carol J.S. Roth. What's the coolest car ever made? Bonus points for picks. You know, there's you know, an endless list of cars that I love. At least in my history, in my lifetime, what's the coolest car? And this is actually before my lifetime, but close, in the same decade, would be the Chrysler turbine car. Now, why is it cool? It doesn't look that great. It's a little awkward looking, has these you know, strange body lines, but you know, it was turbine power. So I'm gonna give that credit for being one of the coolest cars ever. Maybe we move forward a couple years. I'm gonna give some credit to the 427 Cobra. Why? Because it just had a ridiculous amount of horsepower and a very small car. Behind me is one of my daily drivers. It's a Hellcat powered six speed charger. So today, when I drive that home, that'll be my favorite coolest car of the day. It's just one of those things. It's always a fluid, uh, a fluid answer. Umer at Umza. Watching the first two Fast and Furious movies made me wonder, how did it get from what it was to what it is now? The goal is always to top what we did previously. Every film we try to get bigger, better, just to raise that excitement level, to raise the carnage factor, which is one of the things that I truly love, I don't know how it's even possible at this point to top what we did in Fast 9, but I say that on every movie, but somehow Fast 10 will succeed. At Corey Duke, I may be coming into some money, so if you don't mind, what's the best kind of car to buy to make up for a douchey personality? Well, I'm sorry to hear that. You can't be that big of a douche because if you were, you would never admit to it, so I'll give you some credit there. This is a very broad question. I don't know what your car needs are. Is it a two-door? Do you have family? Do you have people in the back seat? Do you have to tow something? There's so many variables there. But I would say whatever category you're digging into, just get the one that has the most performance and the best horsepower numbers and you won't be a douche anymore. At LLSC underscore footballista. I wonder how many cars they wrecked shooting all the Fast and Furious movies. I mean, if you factor in, you know, two, 300 a movie, you're probably in that ballpark. But I guess the bottom line is, I think we've wrecked more cars than any other franchise on the planet. I think that's one of the elements that makes these movies so great. Fast Five with the Vault was probably the number one carnage fest of the franchise. I mean, it was just day after day after day. We shot a lot of that sequence in Puerto Rico and the Puerto Rican government was kind enough to give us access to this huge surplus of government vehicles that were out of service. So we basically had an endless supply of cars to destroy. I think we were paying a dollar a car was the deal we made. It was just one of those things that really helped the cause. I mean, hey, let's do it one more time. Let's do it two more times. Hey, let's double the amount of cars. We just, we just had an endless supply of cars. At DRE Bebe, 
Every time I'm next to an 18-wheeler, I can't help but think of the scene in Fast and Furious. How do they manage to drive under it? If we go back to Fast 1, you have the truck driving. It looks like a normal truck. You have the Honda swarming around it. All of a sudden, the car swoops underneath it. That was accomplished by a hydraulic system in that trailer that would actually raise the trailer up, allowing just enough room for that Honda to swipe underneath the trailer. Fast forward to Fast 7, we felt, hey, this is a good time to bring it back. We've got the GTR, we've got a truck and trailer. Let's redo that one. So this time we built a special trailer that had a little more clearance than your normal trailer. And we actually installed a air system in the GTR where at the touch of a switch, the car would drop about three inches and allow about a quarter inch of clearance as the car made its move underneath the trailer. I like personally the Fast 7 method because basically what occurred on film is exactly how we did the gag. So there was no altering, there was no raising or lowering the trailer. You know, two different films, same gag, done differently, but same end result. At Maddie A19, Dad tried to explain car engines to me and I have never felt that dumb in my whole life. Car engines, um, I mean, there's so many different types of motors. There's rotary motors, there's two stroke motors, there's four stroke motors. Four stroke piston engines being the most common. So let's talk about the four strokes of the motor. You have intake, compression, power, exhaust. The first stroke being the intake stroke. The intake stroke, the piston goes down. So when that piston drops, it creates a vacuum in this cylinder. This vacuum will pull air and fuel into the motor. Piston comes up, compresses that air and fuel, gets right to the top, a spark plug ignites, exploding that air and fuel. That force of that explosion forces the piston down. Last step, exhaust valve opens, Piston travels up, it forces that spent burnt gases out your exhaust pipe, out into the atmosphere. Hopefully you understand how the piston goes up and down now. That piston going up and down changes the up and down force into a rotating force. The crankshaft rotates, the crankshaft goes to the transmission. The transmission will keep your motor in the proper power band at different speeds. You take off from the light, you're at first gear, you go to second gear, you go to third gear. If it's a Fast and Furious movie, you go all the way up to like 16th or 17th gear, and that's how you get down the road. Hopefully that helped without making you feel dumb. That awkward duck. What's the most ridiculous or over the top moment in any of the Fast franchise movies? And I don't know if I wanna say ridiculous because you know, it's all, uh, it's all for a reason. If we wanna to go to over the top, I would say probably the Lycan building to building to building jump pops into my mind as probably one of the most over-the-top gags we've ever performed. You know, what a lot of people don't know is we actually did toss a lichen out of a building. The clearing the gap and making it to the next building, that we might have, might have fudged that just a little bit. But nonetheless, there was a complete set built that was the interior of the first building. And uh, then there was an exterior with the glass and a very substantial drop. And then there was even a crane involved to really get that drop speed, that elevation up even higher. That was just one where I read the script and I went, whoa, okay, you know, here we go. Somehow, some way, it actually, uh, it actually sells. From Atlanta, Binkley. I accidentally asked my husband if a supercharged engine was better than a turbo, and now we're in a 20 minute deep convo. I stopped listening after 30 seconds. I don't blame you because there really is no good answer for that one. You know, this is a battle that's been going on for, for decades and decades and decades. And there's a great argument on both sides. The one big argument for the turbo guys is that they will say, turbochargers are free horsepower. Why is it free? Well, it's free because you're not using the crankshaft to spin anything. You're actually taking the exhaust. The exhaust is blowing on a, a small fan. That fan is connected to a shaft. That shaft has another fan. They're insulated in between. So now you have a fan that's spinning and it just spins because of the exhaust. This fan can suck air in and pressurize the motor, creating boost. So that's where you hear the term turbochargers are free horsepower. Now, uh, a supercharger really is the same concept. It's pressurizing the motor. It's forcing air and fuel into the motor, but it uses a belt and a crank off the crankshaft. So the crankshaft spins, spins a supercharger, forces air. Why is the belt bad? What's the negative? Well, it draws horsepower, like turning your air conditioner on. You turn your AC on, it takes power to spin that AC compressor, okay? Same thing goes for the supercharger. The bigger the blower, the more horsepower it absorbs to spin. The payoff's always better. You're using more power to get it all done. In the end, you can really get the same result. The Hellcat charger behind me is a great example. Supercharged car, and nowadays the technology is there to make that a very drivable and efficient machine. 
I don't have the answer on what's better or worse. I guess the next time you're at the drag strip or watching some race and, you know, see what people are running and that will uh, maybe help solve the argument. This is from at basically I do work. That's good. It's always good to do some work. What do they do with all the wrecked cars in the Fast and Furious movies and how do I get one? The real answer is you probably don't. You know, I mean, the thing is we usually wreck these cars once we wreck them. They don't just go to waste. We will recycle them. We will use parts off of that wreck car to keep another car going. We might cut the car up for interior shots. I mean, they really, by the time we're finished, there's very little left. So at the end, what we really do is we just scrap those cars. There's nothing really left on them that's worth anything. So they go right to the junkyard, they're crushed. And then the ones that are not wrecked end up in Universal's inventory or at the theme parks for a little bit of an afterlife. At Be Real, if you had a choice between a low rider and a muscle car, which would you choose? I will say that I've seen some of the highest quality workmanship in low riders. I mean, these cars frequently are painted underneath. Everything's chrome. There's pinstriping underneath. Nowadays, there's billet parts, machine parts, CNC stuff. You know, in my mind, I, when I think of a low rider though, I think of something that you're going really slow on. You're just kind of cruising. Since I like to drive fast, I'm gonna say I like muscle cars because they're typically built to go fast. So both have their place, both are extremely cool, but yep, I have uh, several muscle cars. I don't own any low riders, but I have a lot of friends that do. At Rob Bloggin. The age old question, what's the difference between power, being horsepower, and torque explained so we can all understand? So this is a, a great question. It's not an easy question and it can get very complex with mathematical equations, the history of it, how it came to be. I'm gonna just explain it to you in very simple forms. Torque is really the relationship between leverage and a twisting force. So going back to the four strokes of the motor, the piston is forced down. As that piston is forced down, it's forced down on a crankshaft. So as that piston is forcing down pressure on the connecting rod, which is forcing pressure onto the crankshaft, you're applying torque right here. If you make the stroke of the crankshaft longer, you'll get more torque. If you make the stroke of the crankshaft shorter, you're gonna lose torque, but you'll be able to gain RPM. The simple answer is big truck, tow and weight, you want lots of torque, you know, high revving car, you want lots of horsepower. The way you make up for the lack of torque in a high horsepower car is gearing. At Shillery Fox, I wonder how much gas a Fast and Furious car needs. Vroom, vroom, I want one. That depends on the car, it depends on what we're doing. You know, there's some cars that we've built that use a tremendous amount of fuel. There's other cars that we built that are, you know, fairly good on the fuel consumption. They're about like your normal hot rod, your normal race car. And we've built a few cars in the past that really did suck a lot of fuel. One that comes to mind would be the heist truck in Fast Five that steals the vehicles off the train. That had a 500 plus inch V8 motor in it, but it was a very heavy vehicle, somewhere around 7,000 pounds, giant tires, and what really sucked the fuel down was a terrain. We were in very soft sand. So running a truck in soft sand, it's heavy with big tires. I think we were getting around one and a half miles per gallon. But then, like I said, we can take a, you know, a twin turbo GTR and that car, even under stunt driving, might still get, you know, 15, 18 miles per gallon. Anytime we're on location, we film in some very, very remote and exotic locations. Like Iceland, for instance, we were in the middle of nowhere. I think the nearest gas station was 50 miles away. So we always bring our own fuel truck. How much fuel we bring depends on what cars we're working with and how far we are from the nearest gas station. So always something you don't want to run out of. At Michelle Cold TW, what is the point of car spoilers? So on your street car, there's really no point other than cosmetic. It just, they look cool. You know, that's really why you see cars driving the street with big wings and big spoilers. Now, if you're going 130, 140, you're at a racetrack, you're at a drag race, they're very important. Spoilers are kind of slang. I mean, it can refer to a wing on the back, it can refer to a, a spoiler up on the front of the car. The real goal is to keep the car on the ground. If you would have had a larger front spoiler, that would have provided downforce on the front of the car, kept the front of the car glued to the ground, not let that air get underneath it and lift the car up over backwards. So that's really the purpose of the front spoiler is to keep the downforce, keep the car on the ground, keep the air from getting turbulent underneath the car. As far as the rear spoiler or rear wing, that is to keep downforce really on the back tires for traction mostly. So street car, not really a big factor. Race cars, whether it's NASCAR, IndyCar, F1 racing, you know, Bonneville salt flat stuff, very important for getting to the front or keeping the speed and safety to keep your car from blowing over backwards. Anyways, good question. Fully vaccinated Clitorissa at Fato Thought 420. 
Okay, a lot, a lot can be read into that whole uh, title there. What's the difference between diesel and gas and why can't it go in the same engine? The main difference between a diesel and a gas motor, there's no spark plug. Air, fuel, compressed, spark, that's what gets you going down the road. Diesel is a little bit different. Diesel requires heat and pressure. Same concept, same four strokes, but the piston comes up, it's compressing the diesel and the air, but much higher pressure than a gasoline motor. And it's that pressure and the heat that actually ignites it, forcing the piston down. If you put gasoline in a diesel, it can destroy the motor. It can absolutely just, you know, you're pulling the motor out, you're putting another one in it. If you put diesel in a gas motor, it usually doesn't destroy it, but best thing to do is avoid that altogether. At Lee, I'm gonna say ski. Somebody stole my boyfriend's drive shaft in the middle of the night. Begging the question, what is a drive shaft and why is it more valuable than diamonds? Well, I'd probably rather have the diamonds than the drive shaft, but let's talk about first what it does. The drive shaft basically transfers power from the transmission to the rear end. If you have a front wheel drive car, it's gonna be a CV axle, rear wheel drive, all wheel drive car, you're gonna have some drive shafts. Now, why is it valuable? It's really not that valuable. So whoever stole it had to have had the exact same car because that's not a common thing. I think if I were you and your boyfriend, I'd be driving around the neighborhood. I'd be looking for a car just like yours that maybe had some performance mods where the guy applied too much power and broke his drive shaft. But it's probably someone close to you with the same car that took it. And I would say the value of a drive shaft is anywhere between you know $400 and $1,200. So I hope you find it. Okay, we have spot blots riding in. Why is the transmission of my 95 Mitsubishi Eclipse automatic slipping? Well, you made a terrible mistake and you should have bought the manual trans. There's just something that's not right about a 95 Eclipse with an automatic. You know, they should all been manual transmissions and problem would have uh, never occurred. A Kyra Dickens, how do you go full speed and even over the speed limit when it's pouring? What kind of tires do you have? Because if I tried that, I'd be spinning into oncoming traffic. First off, don't speed when it's pouring. That's probably the, you know, the, the common sense uh, answer to that. But definitely don't go over the speed limit. And if you are driving fast in the rain, make sure you do have the proper tires. The tire that's designed for the rain will have uh, basically different grooving in it, maybe more grooving, deeper grooving. It's designed to shed the water away from the tire and out the sides. The last thing you wanna do is drive in the rain at any kind of speed with ball tires or slicks or anything along those lines. That's why if you ever watch a NASCAR race, as soon as you start seeing some raindrops on the windshield, that's it. Caution's out. We're done racing. We're going to wait for it to dry. The track has to get dried. Why? Because the slicks have zero traction in the rain and wet weather. They just don't work. Now you go to uh, F1 racing and I wish that all forms of racing would follow this lead. When it rains, they don't stop the race. They change their tires. They put their rain tires on and they get back out there. There's definitely a skill level with driving in the rain. It's similar to drifting. Like if you're a good drifter, odds are you're going to be great at driving in the rain. Something you should do cautiously, Closed track is a good uh, place to start that practice, and you'll see it's really all about the tires and your level of skill. Use caution. At Car News Updates, how exactly does Dominic Toretto blow his engine on his charger in the Fast and Furious during the railroad drag? And I wasn't really involved in that movie, but I'm gonna do my very best to answer the question for you. So if you watch that race, they're neck and neck, they're both giving it everything they've got. I'm gonna say his car either burned a hole through a piston or it broke a piston ring. Because all of a sudden everything starts going haywire, he's losing power, you start seeing smoke, there's smoke coming out from under the car. So that's typically a catastrophic failure. So the question is, well, how does he continue to go so fast? Well, you know, he has an eight cylinder. So maybe he lost one cylinder, he still has seven left, and he has a ton of boost being fed by a supercharger into that motor. So even though something's failed, maybe that piston is now only half as powerful as it should be, but it's still making power. It's still gonna get the car down the track. That's my best explanation on it. At Joseph 3, Jacobo, don't get the point of people revving your engine. Like, what's the purpose of it? Good question, and I totally agree with you. There is no point. There's nothing more annoying than some guy sitting there with the light revving his engine 20 times. It does nothing. So uh, yeah, I think it'd be better if you wanna seem less douchey don't sit there revving your motor. One of the worst things you can ever do is start your car up when it's cold and the oil hasn't warmed up and circulated through the motor and you start revving your motor, that's how you can actually really do some damage. Just going off his photo, this is from the Joker. Watching the end of Fast and Furious 6, oh my God, how long is that runway? It's a great question. I think the math, when you, you know, calculate speed, time, distance, 
comes out to be about 26 miles long. So it is a very, very long runway, luckily for us, because we had a lot of action going on. We actually were on an airport out in uh, northern, north of London. It was like a three hour drive. It was a remote location. I, I want to say it was like a military base. It wasn't like an airport that was open to the public, but cool place. It was huge. And I don't know how long it was, but it was probably two and a half miles. So it was three miles. I mean, when you stood there and looked down, you couldn't see, you know, it looked like you were on 26 miles, but yeah, that, that one did stretch out a little, a little long, but <laughs> Car ride Chili at T Chili 14. I just saw the stunts from the new Fast and Furious and how the f they be coming up with that sh like that in the car. Shouldn't they be out of ideas? You want me to rephrase that or no? <laughs> Sorry if I offended anybody with that one, but just reading them as they come in. It's really a group effort to come up with the greatest action sequences ever seen on film. And that's what we strive for. And there's a lot of time that goes into this. It's not, it's not like, you know, there's boom, boom, boom. Let's, let's write the script, let's do it. Script's written, everybody talks about it, discusses it. There's testing done, there's practicing done. There's, we wreck a lot of cars before we even get to film, just trying to figure out the best way to do things. Could be someone from the construction department or special effects and hey, I got a great way or I, you know, I thought of something and everyone's opinion gets, you know, brought into the conversation and you know, sometimes it goes nowhere. Sometimes it's, hey, that's brilliant, let's, let's do that. I think when you have that type of mindset when you're uh, you know, creating something like a Fast and Furious movie, uh, it really just leads to a better final product. Thoughts on all your questions? Hopefully I you know, gave you some insight of some information of some sort, I hope. Thank you all, have a great day.